So it's my privilege to introduce an old friend, Professor John Patrick. John has studied medicine at King's College and St. George's Hospital in London, and he's held appointments in Britain, in the West Indies, and in Canada as well. And his main academic interest in medicine is the treatment of protein energy malnutrition in various diseases and accident trauma. In the 1970s, he worked in the University of the West Indies in Jamaica and was involved in the breakthrough of PEM treatment there. He came to Canada in 1980 and at the University of Ottawa, John was Associate Professor of Clinical Nutrition in the Department of Biochemistry and Pediatrics for 20 years. John and his wife Sally manage HippocraticRegistry.com, whose focus is the practice of medicine as a moral activity requiring authority beyond themselves, an absolute commitment to the sanctity of life and freedom of conscience for physicians. He's also involved in leading the Augustine College. They've got uh, four grandchildren, 21 grandchildren, and their oldest daughter and family are missionaries in Malawi in Southern Africa, the other children based in Ottawa in Canada. So John, it's wonderful to have you along here today. Please uh, go ahead and enlighten us on from Hippocrates to evidence-based medicine. Thank you. That's a great pleasure to be with you, Peter. Um, I'm talking from a position of having made all the mistakes you can make along the way, but I would like to start by avoiding one. Can we just pray briefly together? Father, we know that only as your spirit works in our hearts and minds and imaginations can anything of significance happen. So we ask for that spirit now, knowing that you are always ready to come to us. In Christ's name, amen. Well, um, there's a lot to do in a very short time, given the title. Uh, I just start by listing what I think are the issues at stake in this discussion. And there are eight of those. Obviously, we're not going to cover them in any depth. But the issues at stake for medicine are an un a better understanding of the objective subjective divide and how to unpack it. Secondly, the recognition that the scientific revolution also changed the meaning of the word fact. Thirdly, that also changed the meaning of the word explanation. Fourthly, it destroyed teleology. Uh, fifthly, it damages trust. Six, it has no basis for justice. Seven, it disorders the hierarchy of the goods. I'll explain that when we get there. And number eight, it wants to substitute professionalism for ethics. That's a pretty disastrous list. Now, when I went off to university to medical school in the 1950s, uh, I had no idea what was happening to me at all. I was in the first generation of working class boys to get into medicine and uh, I loved it, but uh, I was uh, very shy, amazingly, and also um, very unsophisticated. The best thing that happened to me in my first uh, week at medical school was someone took me to hear Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. And I listened to him fairly regularly for the next five years. I lost my faith in practice despite that during residency. Uh, I didn't lose it in the sense of ceasing to believe, but in the sense of ceasing to practice. Uh, and it's practice that makes the church. Um, the good Lord dealt with that in due course, and this is not the place to discuss that. Um, but during that first uh, rather badly done science bit of the course, I was turned into a reductionist without knowing it because the word was never mentioned. And all the things that were going to trouble me, the church had not dealt with. Even Martin Lloyd-Jones didn't deal with them. I look upon reductionism as the major problem we face. It leads into relativism, multiculturalism, moral neutrality, uh, the loss of the sanctity of life, uh, uh, libertarian sexuality, uh, you name it, but particularly those issues. Um, and I knew about none of them. Uh, it turned out the only thing I was fit to be was, was uh, an academic physician. 
uh, and I hate administration, so I managed to avoid that almost entirely uh, by not filling in forms. Um, and because I was publishing, nobody bothered. I got married and uh, we weren't going to have children, but shortly we had two and it ended up with four. And my wife said, I need more of your time. So I actually took a break from medicine to do a PhD in order to see my children. Uh, and that took place in London. And after that, I liked that lifestyle and Sally liked it. So I persuaded the Wellcome Trust to pay the bills for the next seven years. We lived in Jamaica. Uh, I did a bit of medicine, a lot of research, uh, primarily working on the, the resuscitation of 10 pound two year olds. At that point, the first little twitches of what might be coming appeared uh, because students came from smaller islands, often from Christian backgrounds, because Christian kids from evangelical backgrounds do intellectually much better than they should do, uh, according to the sociologists. And we did go to church and I met them there and realized that they were vulnerable to Marxism. My grandfather had been an ardent Marxist and uh, I'd been to Russia in the early 60s and realized what was wrong with it. It's utopian and we're fallen creatures so it can never work. And so I invited them home to lunch, little realizing what that was going to do and explaining to them by asking questions why Castro was actually wrong. Uh, Years later, that came back to haunt me in a very good way, in the sense that uh, uh, they asked me to go back to Jamaica and I go there every year um, because they needed help with dealing with the modern world. But one of the students who was on that uh, patio uh, ended up as a, a lead figure in the, the fight against UN domination. So uh, I didn't take too much notice but then the students finally got to me when I was in my late 40s, really. I, I was always said I was Christian, would do things people asked me to do, but uh, it was very peripheral. And then it became central. Now, two things happened to start this going. One was that uh, uh, I was forced to go to Africa against my will to help some missionaries deal with the problem of malnutrition. And on the way, I read Alan Bloom's book, The Closing of the American Mind, and I couldn't get it out of my head, especially the first chapter. Um, at the end of that first chapter, Alan Bloom, a secular Jew, radical homosexual uh, activist, best professor of philosophy Chicago had in many years. Um, the first chapter is called The Empty Slate, and The Empty Slate is, is a student. This was 1987 but it hasn't changed, it's got worse because students have not been fed any reasonable history and the humanities have been turned into propaganda and they're not very good at dealing with that. But at the end of the chapter, he allows himself to reminisce for a moment. And he says, looking back on his family, he's a third generation Jew in America. First generation had nothing, worked in the sweatshops. Second generation owned the sweatshops. Third generation were all MDs and PhDs. But Alan Bloom was smart and he was honest. And he said, he started reminiscing about his grandparents. And he said, my grandparents were humble folk. They never went inside an institution of higher learning. But everything done in their home was spiritually rich. And they could go to the synagogue where they learned, heard great scholars who spoke not from an alien perspective, like most academics, but from the same perspective while simply going deeper and providing guidance. That says Bloom, and this is a beautiful definition of community. That says Bloom is what a community is. Something that invites high and low into a common story of meaning. That's worth repeating. A community is something that invites high and low into a common story of meaning. Bloom then says, my cousins, all of whom are MDs and PhDs, have no such wisdom. And of course, you'll never hear the word wisdom in university today uh, because they don't know how to talk about it anymore. Read T.S. Eliot's Choruses on the Rock if you want a prophetic account of this. Anyway, uh, that got to me. And when I got back, uh, 
Bloom had gone on to say he needed students to know the Bible, Old and New Testament, because you need all the metaphors, the metaphors of the Western world. And we have to speak to one another in metaphors. We can't avoid it. It's part of the human condition. They come from the Bible. But now students miss them all the while. Um, I couldn't believe it was as bad as he said it was. And somehow I managed to accuse medical students of being biblically illiterate. About 20 of them demanded an apology, which I refused to give uh, on the uh, basis that it wasn't me that made the statement, it was Alan Bloom, but why don't we do the experiment? Tell me how the Sermon on the Mount starts and what it says. And of course, none of them knew anything about it. And neither could I give a coherent account without notes. That had to be fixed, and it was. But bless them. They said, what are you going to do about it? And I said, it's your problem, not mine. I'm busy. And they said, but you claim to know something we need to know. Why don't you teach us? And I said, well, you need an Agnostics Anonymous group. And I set out to deal with the first on my list that there is there has to be something called objective moral truth for human society to continue. They thought that I couldn't win. And of course, every year I won. That was a remarkable change for me. And then CMDA, CMDS, as it was then in Canada, and CMDA in the US got on my case. And I ended up uh, leaving the university a year or two early because uh, I was getting so many invitations to speak all, all around the world, but obviously primarily in the US. And I have to move on swiftly now. So objective and subjective. Uh, is one of the big differences between now and then. So back to 2,500 years ago when medicine got started, uh, Hippocrates and his friends lived in a time where doctors killed patients as they do in pagan societies and as we do now, and that will increase to a significant proportion of people dying every year in the Western world within the next 10 years or so. And probably us excluded from the practice of medicine because we won't do it. We might get to that at the end. Um, that's a terrible thing to do. And of course, those doctors had no effective treatment, just diet, rest, common sense, and of course, prognosis. Most patients come to doctors, in, particularly in the developing world, because they know there's something wrong with them and they want to know where it is and what they have to do. And amazingly, they say thank you when, they tell, when you tell them they're going to die, not because they want to die, because they now know what they have to do. So. Uh, they wanted to increase trust because they realized trust was therapeutic. And the only way they could think of doing it was to say, well, we won't kill. And of course, some patients noticed that going to the Hippocratic doctors was more likely to be associated with the fact that you might be alive a little later on. Now, it wasn't attacked and it, it didn't really dominate, but it influenced medicine. It, it fitted in very well with Christianity. And it wasn't attacked until after Darwin at the end of the 19th century. And then, of course, it was a starting point of the Nazi government. The first thing they did was to legalize the killing of the severely handicapped and the insane, not Jews. Homosexuals came as well before the Jews. In the end, the Jews were the big issue. Uh, but that had been held at bay. If you've never read the Nazi doctors by Lifton, get it and read it because he's he's a left-wing guy but he went to Nuremberg to the trials because he wanted to understand how how it could be that doctors ran the camps the killing camps if you arrived at Auschwitz you were met by a doctor who looked at you and said not enough muscle mass to work straight to the gas chamber enough muscle mass to work you die via the, the work camp that's that was the truth and most doctors are unaware of the fact that we are vulnerable to this kind of thing so uh, they did that and it led to a lot of thought now i'm going to dismiss not dismiss summarize hypocrisies under four points and i'm just going to list them because of time the first was the oath opens with invocation of transcendence why well it's easy to say and you can use this yourselves when people ask you why you think it's important that you be a Christian, you can ask them, if I tell you that I believe that I will be judged for my behavior towards you after death, 
will that make you trust me more or less rationally? And that's a no-brainer. That's why they wanted transcendence. They also understood in this ancient world that medicine was a moral activity primarily. When a doctor comes to see you, they, when, when the patient comes to see the doctor, the patient does not have to take the doctor's advice. He can refuse it. So what do you do? Your expertise has been dismissed, but they've still come to you. What do they want you to do? Well, your job is to help them to, dis to sort out what they ought to do. Now, ought is a moral word. It cannot be derived from physical facts. That's the problem. Uh, the fact value distinction is real. Now, the clever opponents of our position say, oh, I can show that that's not true. Uh, so you have to put a rider in accepting prudential oughts. If you want to catch that train, you ought to go now. That's a prudential ought. But moral oughts, physical facts don't tell you what you ought to do. If you believe, as Muslims do, that if you will not accept Islam in due course, we will kill you. They did that and they felt no guilt because it was what they were commanded to do. That's the world. What you believe really matters. Read Weaver's little book, Ideas Have Consequences, very short, but all Christians should read it at this stage because we're deep into what he predicted some 50 years ago. So uh, the third thing was an absolute commitment to the sanctity of life. And of course, the fourth one was the demand that the patient give them uh, the right of conscience, which is now being eroded dramatically and rapidly. Uh, I doubt whether it'll be here in 10 years if we don't wake up. So uh, that's what they did. And that changed the direction of medicine. Now that period, the ancient Greeks, I, I'm going to go from ancient Greeks to modern with a stop off around the 12th to 18th centuries. Um, what the science was doing in the time of the Greeks, they weren't very good at physics. In fact, Aristotle got his physics wrong and he had to be ditched in due course. But their philosophy and their logic and their mathematics were brilliant. But they never joined technique to science. Science was knowledge and it was only for the people who didn't need to work. And that remained for a long, long while. So it wasn't until the Reformation that that barrier was really broken down. It was one of the great things that, that the Reformation did. <clears throat> the astronomer and the lens grinder got to know one another and it was a profitable engagement. Luther's insistence that everything you do should be done to the glory of God and therefore the humblest of work can be praised as well as the greatest of work. Uh, but techne was separate from uh, science. So the experiments never happened. They never got their hands dirty. Amazingly, Aristotle was a superb biologist, observation only, and some of his stuff was not confirmed until the 19th century. But the physics was wrong. Uh, and they were obsessed with circles, which was also wrong. Uh, and by the way, uh, the fact that something works doesn't mean it's true. Uh, the best or well, the model of the cosmos that had the longest run was Ptolemy's, all based on circles and clearly unrelated to reality, but it did what was wanted, seasons and eclipses and all the rest. And it ran until Copernicus um, and Newton and company. So get it, the, the fact that something works doesn't prove that it's true. It merely proves that it's useful at this point. So that was the ancient world. Now, their understanding of things, when they wanted to explain how, how and why things were as they were, they came up with the four uh, rules of order, the four causes. And just think of a statue. Uh, there are four Greek terms. It's not worth telling you, you won't remember. Um, but you think of a statue, you can work them out in your head. Think of Michelangelo, a piece of marble, a statue. Um, the formal cause is the idea in Michelangelo's head. The material cause, of course, is the marble. The efficient cause is the skills required in this case. And the fourth cause is why was he doing it? And the answer was to make the city more beautiful. That's something modern art doesn't do and it doesn't intend to do. 
uh, and it's our failure to understand that that is a, one of our problems. So those four causes were an immense step forward in terms of analysis, sorting things out, categorizing them, classifying them it is always basic to learning. And so on that basis, things began to get going very slowly. Uh, when Christ came, the world changed because the new world order was inaugurated on Resurrection Sunday. Uh, it's not an accident that within uh, a century or two of Christ, real hospitals began to emerge. All sorts of things began to happen because the new kingdom was coming into, into being. Um, but there wasn't a lot of practical progress. The Dark Ages were not so dark as the uh, intellectual elite like to claim. Uh, a lot of good things were happening. Read that lovely little book on how the Middle Ages made science possible by Hannam. Um, if you want a beautifully written account of the good things that were happening, like plows and water mills and uh, all that kind of practical stuff, clocks. Um, but not a great deal of progress. Now, the church had split around a thousand years into its history between East and West. And Greek learning went East and the West was Latin and very backward. If somebody had arrived from Mars, say in the eighth or ninth century, they would have thought Europe was a very, very backward place of warring fiefdoms and uh, all the real stuff was happening elsewhere, China, India, uh, uh, Islam. Uh, of course, it was turned out to be different in due course. Uh, uh, and when Greek learning, which was preserved by the Muslims, there isn't time to look after that, and ended up in the most liberal bit of Islam in Spain, people went over the, the Pyrenees and brought the learning back, and the church was ready to take off with it. Now, the greatest intellectual feat between uh, uh, Augustine and the, the, the 12th century, uh, 13th century, is of course uh, Thomas Aquinas, who integrated uh, Aristotelian learning with uh, Christian learning. Now, the Pope, not the Pope, the Bishop of Paris was a bit worried about this, and shortly after uh, Aquinas died, he temporarily banned the teaching of uh, Aristotelian logic until it had been reviewed uh, as to what its impact on the faith would be. Now, that meant that they couldn't use their notes from last year. And if they were teaching physics, they got rather used to using deductive logic. I, th I think that forced them into inductive logic, which Aristotle knew about but didn't trust. Because to, to trust uh, inductive logic, starting with a particular and working up towards God, you must believe there's order under the surface chaos of life. This is why we can't transfer our science and technology into a pagan culture effectively, because induction is not thinkable if every heart has its own evil spirit and every little laboratory too. It's a, an incomprehensible idea. You need a Judeo-Christian God for science to happen. And all the historians of science have been saying for 25 years, not willingly, but grudgingly, that it is not true that the church was opposed to science. It was in fact the only uh, place where science got going. It was the only patron of science. It wasn't perfect, of course. It wanted theology to dominate science and that had to go. Um, now, when they banned inductive reading, uh, um, deductive logic, that led to experiments. It took a little while. The first experiments were done in Merton College, Oxford in the early 13th century, 14th century. Uh, one of the people who was there watching was Ockham. And Ockham was a smart guy. Now, philosophers don't like it when we talk about Ockham. He's difficult. He didn't say what uh, we came to believe, he said, at least not exactly. But I'm interested in outcomes. He was clearly watching what was happening in Merton College and seeing these experiments were going to work and they were going to change the world. And that might overemphasize the material world at the expense of the metaphysical world. And he wanted to help God out. He shouldn't do that. God can look after himself. But 
So he introduced the idea of nominalism. He said, as human beings, the only things we really know are the things we can engage with directly through our senses, hearing, touch, feeling, tasting, whatever. All the rest is just words, because it's not just words. But it is just words in the sense that we don't need them for science. And science went from Oxford to Paris to uh, particularly Buridan and Oresme, who was a very smart guy ahead of Copernicus, but he just used, uh, he said, actually for calculating purposes, uh, a sun-centered cosmos makes more sense. But Copernicus was the one that picked it up. Now, but the ideas of Occam went through uh, to Bacon. And this is where the change in the meaning of the word fact comes in and the meaning of what, uh, uh, what explanation means. Uh, Bacon famously said, collect facts, and he meant things that you can be measured. So this was a big change. The change was to go from a qualitative world, which was the ancient world, to a quantitative one. In the ancient world, red was a real thing, but you can't buy a bucket of red. Uh, we went into what we could measure and came up with a different understanding of color. Now, as it turned out, this move was incredibly successful. So just to take one sequence, Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler, Newton, and the world had changed big time. Newton was the last of the medievals. He still believed in the old idea of fact because facts had now become what you can measure. Newton knew that the real facts were the facts that underlie the whole of our understanding. Metaphysical facts, truth, love, honor, justice, all those kinds of things, they really matter to us, but they are eroded and have been continuously eroded by the process that began with the scientific revolution, which, by the way, precedes uh, the Enlightenment. Uh, it was well underway, as I've pointed out, by uh, the 14th century. Now, uh, and it's worth noting another book to read or just one chapter, God's Handiwork in Rodney Stark's book for the glory of God. Every Christian medical student, every Christian student of science should read it because it's a brilliant short take of the standard book on the emergence of science by Lindbergh. And he's done a superb job uh, in one chapter. Uh, what happened was that metaphysics got sidelined in a big way. So within a hundred years of the death of uh, uh, Newton, uh, Napoleon could ask uh, Laplace, where does God fit in your physics? And Laplace, a practicing Catholic said, I don't need God to do physics. And that was true. Physics wouldn't have happened if, the, if God hadn't been in our history via inductive reasoning. And, Good people are not concerned about being politically correct and are not scientists. People like Isaiah Berlin are very straightforward about it, it being induction that made the difference. You will always get the, um, what they say, the, uh, the hypothetico deductive system is what they want to call it, uh, but forgetting to notice that an experiment requires induction and experiment is a crown jewel. But they know if you talk about induction, you're going to end up with theology, and they don't want that. Um, now, we didn't dish, ditch the ideas of metaphysics completely because we, we needed them. I mean, a horrible 30 years war uh, would have been much worse without them, and it was brought to an end by Christians. But we had lost our way. In the 17th century, and this is worth knowing, the dominant members of the scientific class were all Christian. I mean, this, this sequence, just to take one, Copernicus, Galileo, Kepler, Newton, Boyle, uh, Faraday, Clark, Maxwell, Eddington. That's just taking one strand of learning. Every one of the names I've given you is a believer, was a believer. And uh, Boyle, uh, Faraday, and Clark Maxwell had amazing conversions or amazing Christian stories of an evangelical stripe. Uh, we don't even know our own heroes, very sad. So what got lost most dangerously was teleology, especially in biology. If you use the word design in biology, you get a C or worse. But of course, 
God's ironic revenge is waiting around the corner. Genetics has done this. I've watched this whole process. Uh, DNA was first somewhat described by Crick and Watson when I was 13 years old. Um, when I was a, a, a medical student, cystic fibrosis was one gene. It's now 30 or more. Uh, that was genetic fundamentalism. It was all going to be straightforward. Now, with epigenetic phenomena and the, the like, it's not straightforward at all. Uh, and what, 30,000 proteins from a single gene because of trans changes in shape along the way. It's incredible. Um, two people are really putting together the attack on simple Darwinianism, and it's basically over. Uh, one is Stephen Meyer, uh, who's written uh, some beautiful books. Uh, the one that's nicest to read, uh, well, this Message in the Cell and uh, uh, Darwin's Doubt, uh, Where to Start. And the other person you need to know about is, uh, uh, oh, I'm having name block, James Tour, who's a brilliant chemist. In fact, you get the two of them on YouTube at, uh, at an apologetics conference in Dallas uh, about a year, a year and a half ago. Uh, and James Tour in particular, does ap apologetics without uh, mentioning God. He says, I just want to let the chemistry speak for itself. Uh, and that's what happens. So uh, the world is changing. We're in a very different place. And in part because the loss of, of metaphysics is disastrous. And the person who understood that was an Australian, uh, David Stove, who was Australia's best analytical philosopher and an atheist who committed suicide when he got uh, cancer, uh, which is uh, perfectly logical for him, uh, but not before he'd written a brilliant book called Darwinian Fairy Tales, in which he said, they're cheating. He means the, the Darwinians. You cannot get an ought from a Darwinian world. It cannot be done. Lewis put it more beautifully, he put it this way in The Abolition of Man, for the wise men of old, the cardinal problem of human life was how to live a life directed towards God. It's, he put it rather more beautifully than that. Uh, and the solution was self-discipline and virtue. For the modern man, the primary cardinal of human life is how to conform nature to our desires, and the solution is technique. But there's no, they are men without chests. Uh, David Stove fills that out for you in, a, in a, an amusing way of writing and he's a secularist so he's good for us always when you can find an unbeliever who makes your point for you why would you make them yourself only if you're foolish so what got lost is that a Darwinian world where only the, the, the winning of your genes counts cannot lead to a world which is moral only a world which is consequential and utilitarian I was taught this by a boy in the East End of London when I taught a Bible class many years ago. Uh, and he, I asked the class, what's wrong with stealing? And quick as a flash, he said, get in court, sir. That's the modern world. Only if you know what somebody is going to do, can you really trust them? The person who's written about this best is, is, is uh, Robert Fogel in a book called... Uh, the Fourth Great Awakening. Here, another secular Jew who recognized the problem, uh, published his book around 2000. He died recently, uh, got all the usual accolades. But he knew that trust was being eroded. And he said that trust is going to be the, the most important determinant of whether we survive the next century. If there's not enough trust to go around, we won't. And it may force us Christians into the Benedict Option. Uh, the monastery of some form, doubtless a new St. Benedict and a new form. But we've got to think about how the church can, first of all, bring its own mind to light from its slumber of the past 300 years and do something worthwhile. But we probably will have to do something. The other thing that this modern world gets rid of is justice. The person to read for that is Lef, L-E-F-F. Duke Law Review, 1979, just put justice left and that and you'll get it. But it opens thus, he says, I want to believe and so do you in a complete set of imminent and transcendent propositions about right and wrong. 
findable rules as direct us how to live our lives righteously. Again, an unbelieving Jew. He wants the law to be from God. Why? Because if the law is not from God, why wouldn't the judges rule in favor of their own group? They're doing that increasingly, especially in Canada. Uh, he goes on to say, I also want to believe, and so do you, in no such thing as transcendent good and a God, but rather that we are wholly free to decide for ourselves what we ought to do and what we ought to be. What we want, heaven help us, is to be simultaneously perfectly ruled and perfectly free. That's not an option. It's illogical. It's incoherent. It will fall apart. So justice is also cracked. It's in deep, deep trouble. And because these things are breaking down, instead of medical ethics, which was the beginning of these things, there were no ethics lectures when I went to medical school, except from CMF, and they weren't really ethics lectures in many ways. Um, but now you, you'll be taught professionalism, which is a way to get around this with technique. It's always technique. Don't do this, the lawyers will go after you, don't do that. Uh, it's all consequential. Abortion is very important at this level because it has deep, deep psychosocial consequences. Every one of you listening to me who was born after uh, legalization of abortion is different from me. I came into this world as a little brat with a right to be and everybody recognized it, including my parents. But you are all technically choices. Your mom could have got rid of you with no consequence. So deep down in your soul, she can get at you, especially girls. Am I being what she wants me to be? There's a huge neurosis based on this. You have no intrinsic right to be, you have to earn it. And we're seeing that uh, increasingly happen. Eugenics is now being practiced in medicine. We executed people at Nuremberg for doing that. Uh, the hierarchy of the goods. I'll finish leaving this with you. Uh, and we'll see whether I've got under your skin enough to get some decent questions. But good things are not laid out like a smorgasbord, really. Take a bit of what you want, where you want it. They are ordered. I'll just use one example. You will be taught ethics, almost certainly using the Georgetown mantra, autonomy, justice, beneficence and non-maleficence. Now, I ask students all the while, are those things ordered? What's the most important? Well, they've never thought about it and they usually choose autonomy as being the most important. But actually, it's the least important because it's dependent upon the others. You only have to stop and think. When God founded the Jewish nation, he gave them a list of the 10 divine intolerances. He didn't set out to justify them in any way, except I am God, you're not. These are the things you have to do if you want to flourish. And every time you fail to do them, you will cease to flourish and you'll be punished and I'll bring you back because you are a living parable for the world. What we can, what God will not allow and what we ought not to allow can be legislated. And when you've got those in place, you can extrapolate from them to their opposites, the good. So not killing, you can't, you can't say we shall love, you can't legislate that. Only Christ can do that by working in your heart and mind. Uh, so you can get to beneficence. Only when you have a framework of authority can you have justice. And only when justice is in place can autonomy be a good thing. Autonomy without justice and without transcendence is doing what I wish to do. Autonomy for a Christian is being set free from the power of evil to do what you ought to do and what you all know you ought to do. And with that, I will finish. I guess I've gone over time for which my apologies, Peter. No problem. Thanks. Thanks very much, John. We've been listening to Dr. John Patrick talking about from Hippocrates to evidence-based medicine and uh, a bit like standing under Niagara Falls in terms of uh, output of, of content. Huge amount of stuff that John has, has given us. We've got some time for questions now. 
So let's uh, just go to our questions. I wonder, John, if I could ask, first of all, you beautifully laid out the, the principles of uh, Hippocratic medicine, that uh, the oath opens with transcendence, the belief in something beyond. For him, it was many gods, for us, God. That medicine's a moral activity, that uh, there's got to be a commitment to the sanctity of life and the importance of the right of conscience for doctors, which is hugely under threat today. I wonder if, could you just uh, explain uh, to us how the loss of that ethic has led to <clears throat> the sort of challenges that we're seeing today, uh, perhaps particularly so in Canada with regard to uh, freedom of abortion, euthanasia, the threat of doctors' consciences, um, sexual freedom, so-called, and, and so on, just to sketch that out, what we've lost, what we've forgotten, the Hippocrates knew that's led to our current predicament. Well, um, you can find my account of this on my website, johnpatrick.ca. And in terms of these social changes, uh, I was bullied some nearly 20 years ago now into giving a lecture on abortion in Wayne State University um, in Detroit. Um, it happened a, a few uh, months before uh, that I had eventually given in. I always said I wouldn't talk about abortion. Uh, evangelicals had their position, which I agreed with, but I, I didn't have a talk that would account for it in, in a secular setting. Uh, and then I met Robert Spitzer, a Jesuit, and one day it was pushing on me so much that I said to the people in my lab, you can get on with your work without me this afternoon. I'm going to the office. I'm going to shut the door. Don't disturb me. And I wanted to engage with this issue. And at the end of the afternoon, to my horror, actually, I realized I'd come up with an argument and a way of doing it that I thought would work. Uh, I, I didn't want that because this was a can of worms. I actually asked Robert Spitzer uh, about it and he, he listened. He said, well, I think that will work. You'll have to do it. I didn't say anything to anyone, but my wife had set up a website because people said, uh, were complaining that my journeys were not noted and they could have got there and they didn't know about them. And I said, well, that'd be a waste of time, Sally. Nobody will go there, but as usual, she was right and I was wrong. Um, and within a month or so of her putting it up, the students at Wayne State saw, saw that I was going to Ann Arbor. They were smart, they knew where I lived, and they said, would you talk to us before you go to Ann Arbor? And so I did, and they said, it will be the anniversary of the Roe v. Wade decision. We want you to talk about abortion in the middle of the day in a university where the medical school is dominantly black, the group that uses abortion more than anyone else. I said, no, I don't do that. And they said, well, we've heard you speak. We think you could. Uh, I said, flattery will get you nowhere. Um, but they said, we've been praying about it. We think you could. And I didn't have an answer for that. So I said, as long as there's an escape hatch by the lectern, you take me to Ann Arbor before anybody gets their breath back, I'll do it. I didn't need to. It finished in total silence, as it has every time since. And I've done it 80 times around the world by now. Uh, not for CM, the ICMDA, by the way, because uh, and Australia really hated it, the Christians. It, it's a problem. We're, we're still not clear on this. Now, it's called uh, on, on my website, um, Justice for the Unborn. Um, but I, I call it the domino effect of Roe v. Wade. Uh, and it goes through by looking at what must you believe in order to allow yourself to do this. The key to talking about all these kinds of things is finding the right questions. So in the whole talk, I don't make a statement, but I end up by saying, I've laid out two worlds for you. Which do you wish to give to your children? And they're stunned because the, the world they want to give to their children is in fact the pro-life one. So, uh, I'm sorry that everybody doesn't learn to do it because it's such a pleasure to do now. I mean, I don't even worry about it because I know the outcome of the lecture before I finished it. I don't know if that's what you wanted, but it's what you got. So, John, uh, George Sadler is, is saying here, is 
is the sanctity of life a biblical concept? You, you said it's it, it's right at the heart of Hippocrates, but yeah. uh, can you can you because a lot of people wonder about this, don't they? Can you explain what you mean by sanctity of life and why it is earthed in Scripture? Well, I go back to Jeremiah relation. first of all. Before before I made you, I knew you. What comes first for us is who we are, our souls, if you like. And God makes us for purposes that he has defined. Now, you may have the arrogance to do it, but I have not got the arrogance to say to God, I think you've made a mistake. That's just a disastrous thing to say. It cannot possibly be true, so we better start thinking about it. Um, now, I was pro-choice for 20 years over rubella babies because I, was, I bought into the idea that medicine is a problem-solving activity. Uh, and uh, 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 before we had the rubella vaccine, you get, get rubella, the wrong bit of your pregnancy, it's a disaster with cardiac neurological problems. And I facilitated abortions at that stage so that they could start again. We never used the word abortion. It was actually illegal at the time. So I was glad when it was legalized because I didn't think I'd done anything wrong. But now I realize that what one has to recognize is that because medicine is a moral activity, we cannot agree on this. The question is, how are we going to engage? Currently, secularists who are a minority in any thought out sense of the community are telling everybody else what to do. Now, Christians are in terms of, the, of the, how we want, want to live, are, are a large proportion of the population, particularly in, in the US. So we have a right to our own practice of medicine, not on grounds of religion, but on grounds of justice and democracy. Uh, the, the Catholic idea of subsidiarity is the way out, that where there are issues that have to be dealt with by government at some level, then but there's major disagreement in society, then the actual disposition of the money has to be done at the level where there is agreement. So in any large city, there's absolutely no reason why there shouldn't be a pro-life hospital and a pro-choice one uh, in as numbers warrant. And in so doing, we will get two very different forms of medicine, as will be covenantal, theirs will be contractual. Obama specifically wanted contractual medicine. That's the problem. So you've got to be able to talk your way through this and do it by asking questions. Uh, it's another hour, at least. Good, cool. Let's come back to uh, bases for medical ethics. And you made uh, the statement you said, ethics is all consequentialist now. This, it's all to do with technique. There's no idea of transcendence and so on. And you referred to what's popularly known as the Georgetown mantra, which is yes. Beecham and Childress's four principles of, of uh, autonomy, justice, beneficence, which is doing good, and non-maleficence, which is not doing bad. And, and you said that, that autonomy is the least important of all of those because you can't have it with the other three. And uh, Christine Kelly's asking here, could you just further... Uh, explain your statement that autonomy is the least important because that will come as a real surprise uh, to many today where we're taught largely to believe that autonomy is perhaps the, even the only principle. It's the least important because it requires the others and they don't require it. Now, I'm not in any way denigrating freedom, but freedom without transcendence will end up in totalitarian tyranny. It's inevitable. It always has. And that's what the left will not accept. I mean, despite all the evidence, I mean, how many million people have to die under utopian dreams before we say that doesn't work? Uh, the guy who does the best job on this, by the way, is Tom Sowell. If you haven't met him, you should, because he's a black intellectual of the first order. Um, find him on the uh, website Uncommon Knowledge uh, with Peter Robinson. Uh, he's written three books since he was 80, uh, and uh, he, he's got it now. I don't know what he believes because he doesn't tell you that. Uh, but he tells you, before I get to the direct question Peter has asked, uh, 
three ideas that you need to get into your head with respect to data. When people propose a social solution like free access to abortion, the first question is compared to what? Are there any other options? There are, obviously, you have hospitals that do and hospitals that don't. There's absolutely no reason why a secularist wouldn't do it, but they don't want the consequences. And so we need to set it up so the consequences show. His second question uh, uh, is that he wants you to force them. Having asked the question compared to what, uh, you're going to go on and show that the outcomes are very different. Show me the data. The show me thing. Now I've got name block at the moment for the middle one. You'll have to look it up on Tom Soul. It'll come to me in the next minute or so. Uh, but we don't do that. COVID is a good example of ways in which we should have been more articulate, but we weren't. So you have to remind me of your question now, Peter. I'm getting old and that bit has gone into the short term memory lapse. You've forgotten it too. Yeah. So I can't hear you. Well, oh. the, the four the four principles of Beecham and Children. Oh yeah. From yeah, from yeah, what, sure. what's been Thank known you. as the George. I just Metro. needed a nudge. You said autonomy yeah. was the least important. Uh, yeah. and that is, comes as a surprise because that's the main principle that's taught today in many yeah. ethics Well, departments. from our point of view as Judeo Christian people, you go back to Deuteronomy. When God brought the people out of the the desert uh, into the promised land what he did was give them the ten commandments and interestingly it's introduced by grace i am the lord your god who brought you out of egypt in both exodus 20 and deuteronomy 5. And then he sets down the things that you will not do this is non-maleficence he doesn't give any explanation uh he doesn't pandy to us in any way he says these are the rules and it goes on, the talk on this is called Why Are There No Hittites on the Streets of New York? Uh, and when I go to Africa, every time I go, I get asked to give that talk at least a dozen times. And I say, I've done it before. They say, yeah, but we didn't bring our friends. Please do it again. Um, it was a gift to me in Africa, and I explained that in the talk. But they couldn't keep the rules. That is the human condition in a moment. There's God speaking with a volcano and thunder and lightning in a, his own voice that you can understand. And you say, we'll do exactly what you want. Send Moses up the mountain. And while he's up the mountain, you break the first three commandments in order. If that kind of overwhelming experience of God can't make you good, what will? And Moses says, it's what you do in your family. In Deuteronomy 6, he said, these things shall be upon your heart and you shall teach them diligently to your children. The Shema, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And Orthodox Jews know that the way that that is done, an Orthodox Jew will make sure that his children hear all the stories of the Bible from his mouth before the age of seven. At that point, you don't tell them what it means, what they mean. That comes later. Children are incredible memory banks. I think they remember everything said in the first five years uh, because that's what they're doing. It's not making sense to them. That's why they look so confused. We talk about good things and then behave badly. That's hard to, that's hard to process. They get to it in due course. But the stories of the Bible, Old and New Testament, are morally consequential. So children brought up within those stories know what to do when situations arise because the stories are there as a moral reference bank. Now, depending on the story you inhabit and hence blooms, the story forms the community, not the other way around. Um, if you're brought up on the Old Testament stories, you get a Jew with Jewish ethics at best the bible you get christian the, the quran a muslim the veda the vedanta a hindu and so on the book of nature a pagan uh the internet a modern nihilist uh we've got competing stories and we need to sell that fact we multiculturalism is ultimately a lie uh because it's a contradiction in terms 
So those things have to be inculcated and what you get is moral consequence. I will not do that. There's the foundation solidly laid in a child's mind by story before the age of seven. Now, as they grow up, they, can, they have to be taught, Jane Austen would love this bit, about having the right sensibilities to extrapolate from that base to the good. So that you learn to love, you learn to be honorable, you learn to keep your promises, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that then allows uh, a system of justice to which everyone gives agreement. That's what's so brilliant about common law and so much better than having a liberal elite write charters is that it was good people, just and true, 12 at a time deciding and setting precedents. Some were wrong, they were corrected. It, it had immense flexibility but it, it, it was by definition built out of a community. It'll get wrong answers, but they will be sorted out by a process and you, we, those things have evolved. The king had to be controlled, et cetera, et cetera. But only within those stories is freedom safe. Out of the crooked timber of humanity, nothing straight can be made, except when Christ gets to work on it. Yeah, great, uh, great summary. And uh, we'll send you a link to that to that uh, lecture, Why There Are No Hittites on the Streets of New York. And of course, the flip side of, is that, of course, there are many Jews on the streets of New York. And the difference is the worldview and the uh, the Torah and, and the way these kids were brought up by being told the stories of scripture before they were seven, when they could remember them. Some great lessons there. John, we're, we're virtually out of time now, but I want to ask you just one more question to, to finish from uh, Angel Wang in West Africa, who's, who's asking, in reference to the fact that you said you, you went astray as a resident and you, you didn't lose your faith altogether, but you lost its practical outworking. Could you, can you give some words of advice to the many medical students and young doctors and dentists who are listening today just about what you learned through that process and what you would have done differently had you lived through it again uh, on the basis of what you know now? Very differently. Um, first of all, live Acts 2.42. Uh, they continued in the apostles' doctrine, the breaking of bread, fellowship and prayers. Uh, this is something you do whether you feel like it or not. Um, it's required and it can keep you on the straight and narrow. But what I've been talking to you at the moment was a, a flyby of intellectual history as it affects medicine. And what I realized and what happened in the late 90s, a group of six of us at the University of Ottawa, all senior professors were brought together by Providence, by God. Uh, a remarkable group. I was the idiot of the group, the only one who didn't speak five languages. And we'd all watch students arrive from good Christian homes and end up spending 20 years in the wilderness if they came back at all. Uh, I think an evangelical has roughly a 20% probability of surviving university with faith intact. Uh, you can look at Pew and other places to get that kind of data, but it, it, that's the kind of order. We didn't know what to do, but we ended up teaching intellectual history um, and it's worked. So we've been for the last since 1997, we've been taking an average of 12 and a half students a year uh, through a program called Augustine College, uh, .org, if you want to look it up. And we try and teach a chronological account in two very broad brush courses, one from ancient 3000 BC or 6000, depending on how you want to do it, uh, up till 1500 or thereabouts, and then the last 500 years after Christmas. The outcome of this is that the students who take that course, and mind you, that there's a lot of selection bias here, uh, have a, an 80% probability of holding on to their faith uh, and taking professors down en route because they learn to ask the right questions. So we take, we teach the history of the church, we teach the history of science and medicine and philosophy and art and literature. We teach Latin and we teach logic um, and a little music. Uh, they love it. We just finished. We managed to avoid the lockdown. Uh, we were allowed 10 and we got 10. And uh, 
it's always a joy to do it. We've had medical students take a break and come between, usually between just be, at the end of their third year. Uh, one guy from Finland even got the government to pay the bill. Remarkable achievement. Um, we've had doctors come and take the course, um, take a year off, to, eight months off to come and take it. And without exception, they say it's the best thing I've done intellectually in the whole of my life. Um, so I can't understand why it's not spreading because you, you can do it in every university town. You only need four key people. You can always find the others. You do need a theologian, a philosopher, a scientist, and uh, a sort of a father confessor figure, uh, ideally, and somebody to get it known. But we ought to be doing it out. We did it out of church basements. We've now got our own room within a church. Um, we need somebody with a lot of money to give us a bit to pay off the development, the, the renovation costs, because then COVID is hitting us a blow. But I believe in Providence, it will work out. But when, once you realize that we've nothing to be ashamed of intellectually, and you start digging into who you should know, I mean, I know that most of you are evangelical, and I suspect that virtually none of you have even read read Augustine's Confessions. You ought to get a copy, put it by your bed and read a page a night uh, and you'll never stop reading it. Brilliant. The, the first tell it as it happened story of conversion. Uh, and we read double spaced books that were written in 10 minutes without any thought. John, thank you very much. And uh, so if, you, if you're a young, if you're a student or junior doctor or dentist, uh, there you've got, first of all, uh, act, act two, the four things that the apostles teaching, the breaking of bread, prayer and fellowship, so that the practical side of it, but then also the discipleship of the mind and particularly the knowledge of history, really understanding history from an objective and Christian perspective, not just the history of the church, but of science, literature, art, music, all of these things together uh, were, were the key. And uh, so we will be, thank you so much, John. We've been listening to John Patrick speaking on us to us on from Hippocrates to evidence-based medicine. So uh, thank you once again, John. Thank you all our helpers. Thank you all of you who have come today uh, from ICMBA. And we'll see you hopefully next week on ICMBA webinars. God bless you. Blessings on you all. Thank you.